Hi, welcome and thanks for joining us. We'll be starting in just a minute. Welcome and thanks for joining us for our quarterly economic summary. My name is Kara Bloomberg and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Landrum HR, the parent company of HRQ. For those of you that are not familiar with HRQ, we're a professional services firm with over 20 years of serving clients across the country. Our expertise is working with executives with three integrated services, enterprise-wide human capital consulting, providing interim HR talent, and conducting searches for HR professionals. Our consulting team brings a depth of experience in workforce planning and analytics, talent management and talent strategy projects, org design, and HR transformation needs. In 2019, HRQ joined forces with Landrum HR in order to provide end-to-end -end talent solutions for our clients. Our other service lines within Landrum HR include worksite management, a customized labor solution for companies that use large numbers of temporary workers. We also provide PEO services that include payroll, benefits, workers' compensation, and HR. You can find out more about all of our services by visiting our website, LandrumHR.com and HRQinc.com. A recording of this webinar will be sent to everyone that registered. And please feel free to ask questions in the question pane in the control panel. There'll be a quick survey that pops up as you exit the webinar today. We'd appreciate your feedback. We'll try to get to as many live questions as we can um, when Brian fin finishes his presentation today. So it's my pleasure to introduce Brian Wilkerson. Brian's held senior leadership roles in both large enterprises and global consulting firms. He's a successful entrepreneur, having founded and led a consulting and software company that was sold in 2007. He's a deep specialist in driving innovative strategies and using cutting edge planning techniques. He's worked around the globe. Brian is a frequent invited speaker and is sought by the press for his insight. He's authored a number of articles and book chapters. Brian, I'll turn it over to you. I know you've got a lot to talk about today. Great, thanks, Kara, I really appreciate it. Welcome everyone, appreciate you attending this webinar. Lots of good information. It seems like we're always doing this right as new economic information is coming out. So you're actually gonna see some data that literally came out today. So we'll uh, we'll keep it as, as fresh as possible for you. As always, we'll start at the top level looking at overall gross domestic product and what we've seen in terms of growth. Some new numbers came out today and I'll, I'll share those with you. First, to look at Q1 of 2021, the overall growth rate was 6.3%. That was actually revised down slightly from what was the uh, preliminary that came out a couple of months ago, um, but still showing good economic growth in terms of, of overall versus the previous quarter. Essentially, we're still um, looking at a baseline that is much lower than where we were in 2019. So right now, from a gross domestic product perspective, we're still $168 billion in terms of annual dollars below where we were in Q4 of 2019. So we are in no way, shape, or form recovered uh, from the pandemic, but we are showing some signs of progress. All of the different sectors of GDP uh, saw some improvement in, in terms of, of where we have been, um, but are all still below where they were back in 2019. 
the initial estimates for Q2 of uh, the GDP came out this morning and they show 6.5%. Uh, so continuing to see you know, strong growth rates from the previous baseline. And that's a really important piece to note is, is that when we say 6.3% growth or 6.5% growth, these are over the previous quarter. And so we're still at that low baseline, but we are seeing some sustained rates of growth at least quarter over quarter. A lot of the uh, the economic activity uh, is incented along really by some of the interventions that have been done related to COVID-19. In Q2, we saw a lot less investment in terms of direct aid to uh, consumers and, and to individuals, more investment in terms of businesses and governments, um, loan from, from the federal government and the additional paycheck protection program loans, et cetera, that helped spur the economy along in Q2. So we are seeing some improvements in growth overall. There has not been an official uh, call of the end of the recession, but most economists believe that that will be noted as having ended in May or June um, in terms of us officially exiting the recession. But it's important to note, of course, that just because we've exited the recession doesn't mean that we've actually fully recovered. And so when you look at those numbers, that's, that's an important context to, to keep in mind. So from an overall standpoint, we're seeing some continued signs of growth, which is good. To break it down a little bit more by sector, um, we are seeing, you know, the consumer spending still drives a lot of the economy, as we know. Um, total change that improved by about 11.4% in terms of, of where consumer spending was. And then you can see in the subcategories some improvements in a number of different places. Durable goods had some pretty significant improvements, for example. Um, that particular number, there's some concern about where that's heading because of supply, and many of you have probably heard of things like you know, semiconductor shortages and impacting the auto industry and, and other pieces. So there's some concern about the sustainability of that. But um, it is it has been strong in terms of where we saw first quarter improvement. Business investment overall, however, actually went down um, in terms of the, the um, impact from a GDP perspective. We saw a decrease in private inventories, especially retail, which offset what was actually a gain in terms of fixed business investment, but some of the variables um, actually went down. Government spending continued to increase about 5.7%, um, a lot in the federal space and, and less in the local. Um, but we continue to see, you know, net exports being a, being a negative number, and that's been that way for, for a long time. The U.S. tends to be a net importer of things and, and not an exporter. So in terms of the overall GDP numbers, um, some improvement in some areas, some concern in, in some others, but uh, we're seeing some, some, some sustained growth in, in certain categories. From a labor force perspective, we're continuing to see a, a slowness in terms of, of return. And I'll talk about this in a number of different places because there's a lot of dynamics going on when you look at the labor force. So when you look at the overall civilian labor force. We've had a slight increase in just in terms of the number of people who are in the labor force. That happens as people age into the categories where they're eligible for work. So generally when they turn 16, um, they're considered part of the civilian labor force. And then of course on the back end, when you have um, you know people who are at retirement age or aging out of the workforce, et cetera, or, or people who um, pass away or, or leave the workforce in that respect. So we did see a slight increase in terms of the overall civilian labor labor force, but the labor force participation rate went up only very slightly um, from where we were in December of 2021. So basically the same from December 20, 0.1%. So um, very small increase in terms of the labor force participation rate. The unemployment rate itself um, is down. Uh, we're at 5.9% in June of 2021. That's down about 0.8% from where it was in December of 2020. So we're seeing some improvement in there, but it's slow. We're seeing more improvement in, and so the total unemployment rate, just as a reminder, is the number that you typically see on TV. Um, we also look at the U6 unemployment rate, which gets into um, people who would like to be working full time, but are only working part time, um, people who have stopped looking for a job, et cetera. And we're seeing better improvement there in terms of that number. That's actually down 1.9% from where it was in December of 2020. So when you look at these, we're seeing some small encouragement. 
Um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit later is how this compares to available jobs, and you see that there's some challenges when you look at the labor force. Overall, um, the unemployment rate of 5.9 is still high versus historical. Um, you know, when we start to see a, a great economy or a booming economy, we get down below four, and that's when we tend to see a lot of labor, labor scarcity. But I'll talk about that dynamic more as we go along. When you look at some of these demographics in terms of, of unemployment by gender, we're seeing a, a lot of, of variation in these numbers. As you look at it, um, you can see the, the representation in the labor force in the two left-hand columns between men and women, and then you can see the percentage of unemployed who are in each of those areas. In June of 2020, um, which was kind of the, the you know, a, a big height of the pandemic, and there was a lot of talk about how you know, there were a lot of women who were out of the workforce. You know, at one time the numbers were up as high as four million, um, and they were a higher percentage of the unemployed as compared to the composition in the workforce. That dynamics now flipped, and men are now unemployed. You know, higher in terms of the the percentage of the labor force. Um, don't have a really good explanation of that, to be honest with you, at this point. We're still trying to study those numbers and understand what what some of the pieces are, because we still see some of the systematic barriers in terms of childcare and and other kinds of factors that are keeping people out of the labor force, and that is tend to, or at least have through the course of the pandemic, disproportionately affected women, and so not not 100% sure in terms of, of these numbers why we're seeing some of these changes in dynamics, but it's something that we'll continue to look at and continue to study as we go through. When you look at unemployment by age, um, some of the numbers that are here, you start to see some, some different components. Basically, since the beginning of the pandemic, Workers aged 55 and older have been leaving the workforce at a greater rate um, than younger workers. And so you'll see these two different categories in terms of where things say. But basically, some of the studies that are out there have showed that more older workers have opted for early retirement when they lost jobs during the pandemic, as an example, um, and where where basically the workers who were able to collect social security without penalties, in other words, they were old enough to, to be able to do that, we see the most notable increase in terms of, of people leaving the labor force at those demographics. And so some of these things a little bit more understandable in, in terms of some of the dynamics that we're seeing, but you do see some differences in terms of age and, and the impacts from an unemployment perspective. When you start to look at some of the uh, the unemployment trends and some of the impacts from an equity perspective, you know the overall the unemployment rates continue to be the highest for um, black men and black women. Um, and so when you look at the the charts, you can see um, how that's changed over time. But we still see some issues there. Right now, we see about 2.2 women remain, a million women remain out of the labor force from the levels that we saw at the end of 2019. So if you look at that as kind of the height, um, we're still about 2.2 million down. As I mentioned earlier, about 4.2 million women had left the labor force at kind of the height of the pandemic. Um, we are seeing some consistent increases for black and Latino women while white women continue to drop out of the labor force. Um, we also see about 1.5 million white men have not rejoined the labor force. Um, and then we're starting to see that um, as a percentage basis, black and Latino men, Latino men have higher counts in the civilian labor force than they were in December of 2019. So very uneven in terms of where things are from an overall equity perspective when you start to look at employment and, and try to break it down by race. Some of the interesting trends that we're starting to track um, are, are really related to this labor dynamic. A piece of good news is certainly that separations from, you know, layoffs and, and discharges is, you know, is, is, is showing that it's lower. And we're seeing that businesses are really desiring to keep the people that they have. And we're finding that 
even though the unemployment rate is going down, we're seeing that there's still a lot of labor scarcity that's out there. And I'll talk more about that dynamic. But when we talk to, you know, a lot of our clients and, and what we observed anecdotally is, is that there is a lot of talent scarcity. Um, there are a number of industries that are hurting in terms of the, the inability to find workers and their inability to, you know, um, really meet their needs. So a number of service or or food service or those kinds of things have curtailed hours or curtailed, you know, actually days that they're opened, et cetera. We're seeing a, a from a lot of our our clients a real concern about what they call the resignations of impact employees, people that they want to keep actually resigning and, and moving on to other roles or, or other things. Some of that, as, as many of you may have read in terms of the dynamics that are going on now, are from people deciding to change careers, move into a different field, et cetera. But frankly, a number of them are, they are dissatisfied with either the way their company initially handled the pandemic or the way that they're handling return to work. And that's part of the dynamics that we're seeing in organizations now. So a lot of concern in terms of businesses' ability to actually, you know, get the workers that they need and retain the workers that they need. You're starting to hear, uh, um, you know, terminology like the great resignation um, that's that's starting in organizations. And while the numbers from an overall sort of labor statistics perspective aren't showing the increase as of yet, from what we've observed and anecdotally, we can see those, those waves starting to come and starting to increase in terms of those dynamics. We're also seeing a, a number of interesting things. We've been doing a lot of uh, conversations with chief human resources officers and executives and organizations and there's some interesting dynamics for example many organizations are reporting that now that they're starting to look at their return to work strategies many of them had high percentages of employees who just moved and and left wherever they were and didn't notify their organization and now are expecting that they're going to be able to work remotely full-time and those kinds of things and, and organizations are struggling with what are their policies what are their practices and how are they going to deal with some of those things from an overall unemployment duration perspective, we're starting to see some improvements and, and some encouraging things here. So for example, you know, the number of people whose duration of unemployment has exceeded 26 weeks is kind of stabilized um, at about 4 million for, it was quite a bit higher and, and we were seeing people on very, very long um, unemployment. We're seeing also in terms of unemployment duration, a number of, um, a number of, of states that have opted out of some of the supplemental unemployment programs that were uh, provided by the federal government, um, some of them in direct response to complaints from employers of their inability to find workers. So in a number of states, employers kind of went to their state governments and said, we can't find workers because of the supplemental unemployment pieces. And so in 22 states, they opted out of or ended the you know supplemental $300 unemployment benefit that was coming from the federal government um, in about 20 states they got rid of the unemployment benefits that were put in place for self-employed or gig workers or the supplemental benefits that were there for people who have been unemployed six months or more. Um, all of those programs are scheduled to end on September 6th from a federal perspective. We'll see what happens with those and, and if any of those are continued, but some of you may have seen that, you know, the the Congress is already going after some of that money that, you know, from states who terminated those supplemental benefits to fund the new infrastructure bill that came out. And that's part of the compromise that was announced um, yesterday and today in terms of how that was going to be paid for. So it's not anticipated that a lot of those benefits, those supplemental benefits will be continued. Um, I, I think that even in the states, though, that have terminated those benefits, there hasn't been quite the increase then in terms of people returning to the workforce that a number of people would have liked to have seen or that employers would have liked to have seen. So there's a number of dynamics that are going on and, and just a lot to watch right now. Um, as we've talked about in previous sessions, you know, the, the, uh, the U.S. Census is conducting an ongoing um, household pulse survey, and they're asking a number of different questions around um, household dynamics, et cetera. Um, this is a bit of a mixed bag in terms of, of what we're seeing around some of this. So um, the 
question that has been asked since the beginning is, you know, how many how many households expect a loss of employment income in the next four weeks? And the good news is that that number is way down. Uh, the high was about 27 um, percent of households that expected that even as recently as January, um, and that's gone all the way down to about 12.2 percent. So people are feeling a little bit more, um, a little bit better about those pieces. We're seeing, you know, some positive progress in terms of less people experiencing food scarcity um, and and we're seeing you know some of those numbers start to go down though it is a little bit up from March to June and so so that's certainly concerning um, we're seeing some slight downward trends in housing insecurity which again is is an important um, factor as you look at it um, they're starting to ask some new questions, things like, you know, are you uh, unable to access childcare or have you had an impact from, you know, childcare scarcity in terms of ability to work, et cetera. And so we'll look at some of that data over time, but but just starting to get some baselines there now. So, you know, overall, from a standpoint of some of the, the trends that we have been watching, around real impacts to people from a pandemic, starting to see some progress, but but still not really where we need to be. In terms of jobs overall and, and job comeback, I'll, I'll show a couple of slides in terms of the um, this piece. So we've seen monthly job gains since the beginning of the year. Um, so in terms of the available jobs that are out there, um, then we're, we're seeing the increase in terms of that. So some of those those numbers you'll you can see here. So we've seen since um, you know from May to 2020 to August 2020 we gained about 10.8 million jobs, and then from September 2020 to December about 1.3 million jobs. And then as you look at this year from January to June, the increase is about 3.3 million um, overall. So there was a massive um, increase in the number of jobs available that started in from May to August, decreased quite a bit September to December, and now we're we're starting to see a, a, a net increase again um, in terms of the rate of new job openings. Um, I'll get into the industry numbers in a moment, but to give you some perspective on these pieces, I'll, I'll say two things. One is, is that we're seeing a lot of these gains are in some of the lower paying service sectors. Um, and some of that is really speculated to be the reason why we're seeing people not coming back, even though the jobs are available, is, is that it, it may not be the kind of job that they want or the kind of jobs that they want to, to be in. The other thing for some perspective is, is we're still about 3.5 million short of the number of jobs that we had in December of 2019. So when you look at it from an overall perspective, we're still way down from where we were in terms of the height. And so there's still a lot of opportunity from a job growth perspective. To look at it in terms of, of job gains in the second quarter, um, a bit of a mixed bag. From a goods producing perspective, we lost 2,000 jobs um, overall. So, you know, some of that is is in construction and in that space, especially specialty trade contractors. Um, manufacturing has actually been a, a really mixed bag as well. For example, we've seen gain in things like furniture and fabricated metal products, but those have been offset by a number of challenges in terms of motor vehicle production, parts production, et cetera, where scarcity and prices have really um, put a dent in those things. When you look at the total you know, non-farm and, and services kind of area, a lot of increase in services. But when you look at that $1.4 million in, or 1.4 million jobs that were gained in Q2, and you look at the different categories there, basically 977,000 of those jobs um, were in accommodation and food services. So you know, three quarters of the total really is in that first category of accommodation and food service. And again, not as attractive maybe to some of the, the folks who are out there looking for work. So, you know, 82% of the job gains that we saw in the first quarter really came from services. We've seen increases in retail trade, transportation and warehousing, and professional and business services as well as education. So a lot of gains, but still being driven heavily by that sort of food service and accommodation. One of the things that we're seeing is that the, the scarcity of workers and the increase in the number of jobs is starting to push up 
salaries in a number of markets. So in a lot of major metropolitan areas, um, traditionally maybe low paying jobs, even restaurants and fast food and those kinds of things are starting to advertise starting salaries in the 15 to $17 an hour range um, just because a lot the, the scarcity of workers is so great that it's literally causing um, some places to be unable to open. Um, you know, recently when, when I was traveling for business, I found a, a number of restaurants that could only open their drive throughs because they didn't have enough staffing to open you know internally so they were only open for takeout or, or for drive through because of directly because of those staffing issues and so there are real operational impacts that that folks are seeing in terms of this even though we're seeing overall sort of strong you know uh, jobs overall in terms of job openings, um, we're again continuing to see an increase here. We've basically seen large increases, you know, every month since January of this year. And, you know, we have about 9.2 million job openings for May. Um, and, and that, you know, is, is a lot in terms of that. We were in April, we were at about 5 million. So, we're seeing this still, again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, accommodation and food services, arts, entertainment, and recreation are some of the highest number of job openings. Many of those are places that are, you know, just starting to open up as the pandemic, uh, you know, starts to subside, or as I should say, as restrictions are start to be lifted um, in certain areas. And so, you know, you're starting to see some, some of those things bounce back. What we're really seeing is we should be seeing larger decreases in the unemployment numbers, given what we're seeing in terms of job openings and overall job growth, but we're not. And, and we haven't, and, and even as these, these continue to tick up, we're just not seeing people take the open jobs that are out there. And, and really there's a number of reasons that people report in terms of that. People and, and a lot of employers tend to want to blame the, you know, supplemental unemployment and those kinds of things. And certainly that's a factor. But there is also a question of really are wages keeping up with where they need to be? Um, I mentioned earlier that we're starting to see some of those things tick up, but a lot of industries are still pretty low in terms of wages. I mentioned earlier that some of it, uh, some of the growth is really in industries where the type of work may not be the kind that's attractive to people. Um, but we're also seeing that there's still a lot lot of what I would call pandemic hesitation. So in other words, people are, are, are wondering about their own safety, about things like the Delta variant and, and some of those concerns and trying to understand, is it safe to go back to work in person? Um, or, you know, is it safer to try to find a job where you can work remotely? So if we're unable to really have more uptake and, and there's continues to be labor scarcity and, and you know, a lot of open jobs, we're going to con see continued pressure on wages. We're going to con see continued challenges in terms of operations and opening hours and things of that nature. So this is a key trend really to watch and, and make sure that, that things stay on track. From a self-employment perspective, we've, this has really been, pretty steady. Um, you know, we've really seen that self-employed numbers have been pretty consistent in terms of, of where they have been historically. We saw some dips, um, obviously, as you look at the charts in terms of the, the height of the pandemic and, and where things were. But by and large, you know, self-employment has returned to, you know, fairly historical numbers or at least, you know, what it's what it's been in the um, the late 2010s and 2015 and 2019. So those numbers are st holding fairly steady. It'll be interesting to see now, you know, we with the uh, reduction or, or elimination of benefits in a number of states for those who are self-employed, um, how this number changes. But these these have actually held fairly steady over time. Another pulse survey uh, that the U.S. Census has done is really related to um, the the small businesses and, and what some of their plans are and, and what they're doing. So this is where we're starting to see some concern in terms of the overall direction of the economy. So if you look at it, fewer small businesses plan on hiring employees in the next six months. Um, that's important. As many of you know, small business is a huge driver of employment in, in the U.S. overall. Um, we're seeing, you know, some uneven changes in terms of um, just very short-term things. So we're seeing, for example, that, you know, slightly more 
small businesses decreased the number of employees in the past week when this survey was taken um, more than previously it had increased the number of employees. So it's very uneven in terms of some are shrinking, some are growing in terms of the very short-term uh, question that's being asked around Pulse surveys. Um, we're seeing a lot of numbers that are, are concerning around things like delays from suppliers. So 38% experienced you know, it, delays from domestic suppliers in the previous week. Um, a bunch are seeing delays from foreign suppliers as well. So that number has ticked up from previously. Um, you can see that those numbers are continuing to increase from, as, as you look over time, those delays from, from suppliers. And that is inhibiting growth. Um, we are finding in a number of industries that people are that companies are having to create price increases based on either increased prices from suppliers lack of lack of supply and inability to get you know raw goods having to play more for those materials and so concerns about inflation are certainly there um, concerns about suppliers certainly there and how that might inhibit some of the economic growth and where we might end up with some of those things so you know as opposed to some of the household survey results where we're seeing some improvements in sentiment and some improvements in some of the metric when you look at some of the small business pulse survey results i would say the numbers are more concerning and there are trends that are there that that we're we're concerned will slow the growth rates or you know in, inhibit the the recovery aspects um, that we've been looking at so some overall numbers um, some of this stuff is 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 a little bit difficult to digest when you look at it and, and trying to di dive into it um, in the short term we're seeing some good numbers in terms of consumer confidence and and things like that um, we're also seeing you know some some okay numbers in terms of of price increases but when you look at um, percent changes in hourly earnings um, that number is at 3.6 percent is actually lower than it's been previously where we were seeing that a number of jobs dropping out of the the economy was pushing up the overall wages but now as some of the lower paying jobs start to return some of those are are you know actually starting to come down in terms of changes to hourly earnings and then you compare that to the annual percent change in employment cost so you know basically the 3.6 percent is is meant to represent what people are taking home and the 2.6 percent is meant to represent what um, employers are paying in terms of increases in cost and so you know some numbers that we watch closely obviously to try to understand um, what are costs doing and how is that flowing through to workers but you know good news in terms of consumer confidence up at 127.3 it's the highest level seen since the beginning of the pandemic so that's good um, but there are concerns about inflation overall what we're seeing in terms of the number so far is, is that inflation hasn't yet significantly impacted spending and confidence but when you look at the a potential 5.4 you know percent annualized number from a consumer price index perspective that's concerning that's much higher than we've seen in previous years um, you know in the past we've generally seen you know 2.4 2.5 percent um, so that if that trend continues it's it's definitely going to um, it, it's going to be concerning concerning and can inhibit growth um, just if you look at at some of the drivers of that increase in cost. Used cars and trucks um, have gone up quite a bit. Energy prices have gone up over 40% in the past 12 months um, you know things like utility and gas service up 16 percent uh, so we see a number of places where you know some of these may be short-term price increases so very often when you come out of a recession you'll see some of these prices go up as people bring supply back online as consumer demand grows and then it kind of levels off so these are some of the things that we're going to continue to look at and continue to understand you know how are these dynamics going to affect um, economic recovery overall from a leaning indicator's perspective, trying to understand where things are heading, um, we're seeing, you know, that some of these things are, are starting to level off or, or, you know, not growing as much as, as we had seen in the past. So commercial construction spending, for example, has kind of leveled off. You can see the trend line there. Um, we started to see some increases in, in 2020, and then that's, that's reduced quite a bit. Um, you know, as mortgage rates have started to tick up a little bit, they're still relatively low, um, and we've seen some housing 
housing markets start to cool off, uh, you know, and, and, and for some of you who are in hot housing markets, what that may mean is, you know, five overpriced offers instead of 10 and, you know, getting offers in two days instead of one. And I realize that's not a much of a comfort, but we are starting to see some markets cool off a little bit and some cool off fairly significantly from a housing perspective overall. So, um, so not, you know, not a lot of indicator of, you know, strong continued growth in those spaces. Um, from a durable goods perspective, you know, we're, we're looking at durable goods orders. Um, and they're, the good news is, is that we're, they're up about 41% from where they were a year ago, but you can see the growth rate has started to level off and even go down a little bit when you look at the chart. Um, some of that is concerns about supply and concerns about inflation uh, that are starting to drive people's decision-making in that respect and, and trying to decide, you know, what they're going to do in terms of durable goods orders. So I think that, you know, a lot of the information is, is really a mix bag in terms of, of what we're seeing around, um, you know, around potential growth. And then there's this. Um, when you look at it, and, and it's been in the news a lot over the past couple of days um, to the past week, we are starting to see uptick in a number of places around COVID, um, COVID case rates. So, when you're looking at this chart, you basically, if you start to see blue, that's where you start to see concerns, right? And so in a number of spots around the country, a number of states, we're starting to see things hit hard. We're starting to see the reimposition of mask mandates in a number of markets. For example, you know, Las Vegas, which had been early on trying to, you know, open up and bring tourism back and those kinds of things, reinstituted mask mandates, I think in the last 48 hours, basically. Um, some of the states like Florida, et cetera, are seeing high increases in case numbers. Um, you're starting to see in Texas a number of, of blue and even dark blue spots. Um, so these are big concerns in terms of potentially, you know, derailing recovery and re derailing growth. Where are we heading in terms of, you know, restrictions and some of those things? I, Obviously, I can't say I, I'm not a public health person um, in terms of, of making those decisions. But what I can say is, is that a lot of the noise that we're hearing um, is concerning. Um, you know, I think that we're we're really starting to to wonder, you know, are certain geographies going to go back into lockdowns? What's going to happen with some of these things? Um, and I think that we have to be really careful in terms of how we address um, some of these pieces, because the I think the markets in a lot of ways, and I'm not talking about the equity markets, but just in terms of the overall economy is, is jittery, right? I think a lot of people are concerned about inflation and about prices and where they were. I mentioned earlier, some people hesitant to return to the workforce, you know, given some of the concerns about COVID and safety, et cetera. And as, as many of you know, we're coming up to school reopening. School reopening, you know, was a major issue in the past in terms of, you know, what the role of parents in remote learning and, and child care and all those kinds of things were. And so a lot of, um, you know, school districts are really trying to finalize their plans for return to school and what it's going to look like. I know we here in, in the district that our children are in, you know, they basically start school in less than three weeks and they still don't have final guidelines in terms of masks and, and things of that nature. So there's a lot of uncertainty out there. And I think if we continue to see some of these trends in terms of increases in case rates, et cetera, then we're, we're, we're in for a little bit of a bumpy ride. Um, so I think organizations need to be careful and, and, you know, monitor their local area and really understand what the dynamics are. That really leads to strategies and what organizations should be thinking about. Um, and I'm going to take this from a context of, you know, kind of where where should you be in terms of some of these pieces, but also what should you be thinking about in the, in the short and intermediate term. I, most organizations really at this point should have a good handle on their return to work strategy and what that's going to look like as well as you know what what types of changes in culture and you know how how they want their employment brand to be seen that they want to move towards now that may mean that there's and should mean that there are contingency plans in place if we start to see case rates go up, if we start to see, you know, new restrictions put in place or old restrictions reimposed, however you want to look at that. Um, so organizations should have learned from the pandemic that we need a contingency plan and we have to have that in place. And how are we going to, 
keep the gains that we've had from a culture perspective? How are we going to drive towards a desired culture, whatever may happen, whether we're able to go to sort of a more, you know, closer to normal or, you know, more of a, um, a, a modified or if we end up, you know, back um, backsliding in progress in certain areas. Um, many of you may have seen some recent articles about um, organizations like Google actually putting in requirements that you can't return to the office and lecture you're vaccinated. Um, we'll see how some of those things play out, um, both in terms of an overall, you know, employment brand as well as a legality perspective. But there are a number of organizations that have put in requirements that, in order to return to the office, you actually have to be able to prove um, that you've been vaccinated. So um, some pretty br big brands and big names have actually taken that step, and so we'll, we'll see how that plays out and how that um, works with, um, you know, with with other organizations haven't really seen yet what the the sort of talent reaction is 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 going to be so but as an organization you should really have, have have finalized or be close to finalizing your return to work strategy and what that's going to look like with a keen eye on culture impacts and, and employment brand impacts secondly um, it, it's really important to stay close to your talent right now I mentioned that sort of great resignation not my term it's a term that's that's been in the media um, but we're seeing that tick up in you know sort of voluntary separations from organizations and people quitting basically uh, organizations and so it's important that you understand key talent and where there's risk there but also the knowledge that they take with them um, whether it's key customers key processes whatever it might be it's it's really important to have a good handle on that and how can you protect yourself against that this is you know in the context of there's all kinds of interesting things going on right now in terms of the the current administration's view on changing labor approaches etc um, and and I think we predicted this early on when before the new administration was even sworn in you know we're seeing things like um, a desire to eliminate non-competes and what's the impact of that going to be and so you know just a lot of things that that haven't been looked at and haven't been touched in a long time now seem to be fair game and so i think from a labor market perspective it's it's going to be a wild ride and you know key talent retention and making sure that you keep the folks you need is is obviously very critical i've talked about this before but organizations very consciously looking at resilience and agility. I think that, you know, all the things that I've talked about in the past few minutes about the uncertainty around where the economy could go, where the pandemic restrictions should go, et cetera, just continue to really underline and highlight that need for continued agility, continued resilience. And, and two big places to look at that are the supply chain and then in human capital, right? How are you going to manage the supply chain disruptions? How are you going to build a more resilient supply chain overall over the past six months I've seen more focus on you know really massive massive changes to the supply chain blending of onshore and nearshore and 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 offshore together um, more risk management more sort of contingency planning etc than I've ever seen um, it's it's a good thing in some ways because it's something that we've needed for a long time we had created some very fragile supply chains through a lot of our um, just in time and, and things of that nature and now people are coming uh, more back into a balance and that's really important but the same is true with human capital I mean if you look at some of the things that I talked about earlier Early in this presentation around organizations having to curtail hours, curtail days of operation, et cetera, because of talent scarcity, um, it's a really important factor. In a lot of organizations, human capital is the supply chain. And so when you're looking at that impact on, on revenue and, and the ability to actually make money because you just don't have the people to staff, um, it's, an, it's, it's an important factor for organizations to be looking at. Some of this comes back to workforce planning and having robust workforce planning, but it also comes to talent acquisition um, strategies and processes, succession planning strategies and processes, and how all of those things work within an organization. So now is the time to make sure that you've really got the right human capital processes, the right talent from a human capital perspective in terms of the folks who can actually help you go out and find the right people and retain the right people. So both of these are, are really ripe in terms of organizations fine-tuning their strategies and, and making sure that they build that resilience and agility. Labor automation um, is another one that we've been talking about for quite a long time. You know, from the beginning of the pandemic, um, you know, when we started having these conversations last year, one of the things that we were saying is, is that it's really important for organizations to look at their labor force and 
determine where strategic automation is really an imperative. And when you look at those things, it's trying to understand where do we have some of the greatest risk in terms of disruption from human capital supply, scarcity of workers or, or scarcity of certain knowledge, et cetera, and where is the greatest potential that we can address those risks through appropriate automation um, and trying to figure out where those things are. Some organizations have actually accelerated their plans around artificial intelligence and, and that type of much more sophisticated automation in order to address some of the risks that they encountered or the issues that they encountered from a you know, labor scarcity or labor unavailability perspective during the pandemic. So labor automation really has to be a, a high on the list of, you know, priorities from a human capital and from an overall C-suite perspective, um, because as we go through more, you know, more changes and more um, back and forth in terms of restrictions and, and things that might happen, it's going to be critical to organizations really stabilizing and being able to sort of, of move forward in that respect. And looking at workforce composition and cost is also uh, related, but, but a very important component. When we look at the labor force overall, trying to really understand where our cost drivers and our risks are, trying to understand where we have the biggest potential for supply disruption, and thinking about creative strategies in order to be able to address that. Whether that's increasing the use of contingent labor, whether that's increasing the use of outsourcing, blending that with labor automation strategies and making sure that those are, are all you know brought together in, in terms of a comprehensive look at, at where things are, all of these things are, are really critical. So Organizations at this point should really be moving what I would call beyond the kind of blocking and tackling components and trying to get more to a place of, you know, how are we preparing ourselves for what could come and what sort of, of challenges that we may face in both the intermediate and the longer term. Um, I realize that in some cases organizations are, are still struggling with number one in terms of some of their return to work strategies, but you know it's it's critical that organizations really start looking at all these different factors and trying to start better positioning themselves for whatever's coming. Which, um, as as good as I am at predicting, sometimes I can't predict <laughs> for sure <laughs> what's coming in in terms of some of these pieces. So you know, as an organization that partnership between human resources and the operations side of things to really comprehensively address some of these components, being able to look at where some of the biggest pain points are in terms of operations and, and strategy and, and starting to address those things is, is really the key imperative for, for organizations right now. So with that, I will um, open it up for questions and what people have on their minds. Thanks, Brian. Great job. And just want to recognize your team. Um, I know it just works <laughs> quite frankly down to the hour these days of um, right. getting the data in that you can and being as timely as possible with these updates. So really appreciate the work that you and your team do. Um, as usual, I think it's a it's a course of everyone starts taking in all the information that you're sharing around the data and statistics, and then um, we get to the what should we be thinking about now, and the flood of questions starts coming in. <laughs> so, um, so I'll start with with actually my personal favorite question um, because I think everyone's grappling with this is and just um, having a management team that's kind of all over the place with potential solutions. Um, you know, a lot of opinions, right, about return to work strategies, about next steps strategically. And so the question is, what's the best way to get a management team refocused on the theme? Well, I think that the, um, are, are you talking about just the return to work piece specifically or? Yeah, or you know, I, I think, yeah, I mean, the, the person didn't specify, but, but I think probably, yeah, we'll start with return to work, but also, you know, so many dynamics of the strategy of moving forward, just like you said, with culture and brand and um, being focused there. Yeah, it's, what I'm going to say is probably going to be slightly unpopular, but um, yeah, I, I think that there's, management is really at a decision point. Um, you know, I, I think that there are a number of organizations that I've seen that have said, okay, this is what our return to work strategy is going to be. We're going to emphasize more of the in-person trying to bring people back to work, um, you know, and, and lean more towards that side, recognizing that 
there are a lot of, of people in the workforce and a lot of talent who just frankly isn't going to accept that. They want to, you know, stay more remote. They want to stay with those more flexible approaches in those, those cases. And so they may vote with their feet and you may lose some talent because of that. Um, mm -hmm. But if, if, you know, as a management team, you really feel like that's critical to your success going forward, then that, that's certainly a decision that you can make. I think that there is, that's a smaller percentage of organizations, but there absolutely are some who, who are taking that stance and, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the culture that they want to drive. I would say more organizations, the higher percentage of them, the dialogue now is really, what's the right blend what support are we going to provide to people from a remote perspective and the biggest thing is how are we going to manage the risk because with a greater remote workforce there is more risk um, for those of you who haven't gone through this yet i mean even thinking about things like OSHA and ergonomics and all of these components and what's people's liability if their workforce is remote and these things is is a really hefty set of considerations if management isn't willing to engage in the conversation, that may be a sparking point in terms of really helping them think through some of these things at a deeper level. What risk are we taking on? How are we going to mitigate that risk through a greater you know, percentage of a remote workforce? How are we going to address some of those pieces? Um, because you really, there's a lot to think through and there's a lot to look at. Um, even the thing that I mentioned earlier in terms of what are we going to do if people move and don't tell us, right? <laughs> I mean, are we going to let them keep their job? Do they have to be in certain locations, et cetera? So, you know, in order to avoid significant disruption from an operations perspective, management really has to engage in that. I think the other thing that management has to engage in right now is the what if, and that what if is what if we go back to more restrictions? What if we end up back in lockdowns? Um, you know, what is our strategy and how are we going to do it to address that piece? Because we should have learned a lot from the last go around and, and really be able to address this in a more comprehensive way. So I think if you're, if management isn't really willing to engage in these things from a more proactive and strategic perspective, focusing on some of the risk components and how we're going to address those is going to be really important. Yeah, I'll, um, that's great. And, and this question leads right into what you were talking about with having a bit of a disconnect too, because um, this, this question was from an employer that says, hey, we really want to engage employees in discussions around returning to the workplace because as an employer, we feel there's been a disconnect. Um, and and we between employees and employ and us on basically what what we want to see for the future and that the employees are more disconnected being remote um, and probably struggling maybe with what the employer may want to do and returning people to work and maybe what their employees want. So how do you how do you suggest they have those kinds of communications? Well, the first thing I'll say is don't have them if you're not willing to listen. Um, if you're not willing to actually take the advice and, um, you know, or, or you know, align with the, the preferences, that doesn't mean you have to give people everything they want. But if you're not at least willing to, you know, go with the, the feedback that you get and, and make some changes and adjust maybe some of the employer's preferences, then um, don't engage in the dialogue because it's just going to make it worse <laughs> in, in terms of yeah, that. So I think that's, that's a really advice. important yeah. piece. Um, mm -hmm. But what I would say is, is that um, keep the keep the the discussion centered on where you're willing to flex and where you're willing to accommodate, um, you know, the desires and and needs of employees. I think what we've seen from companies who have engaged employees is that they find a lot of innovative thinking and a lot of, you know, sort of specific strategies that, that actually can work in the environment and, and work for everybody in terms of that. So there's a lot of benefit there um, if you are willing to engage in those. But I think you have to start the conversation out by saying, you know, we're these are the boundaries. These are the things that we're willing to do and the things that we're not willing to do and then sort of focus the conversation within those boundaries. Um, those tend to be much more positive. Um, but recognize, you know, that, that a lot of employees out there, a lot of workers out there are going through quite a bit of soul searching for lack of a better term in terms of is this the career path they want to be in? Is it the environment they want to be in, right? And and you're not going to be able to please everybody. Um, so, you know, finding the things that work best for the business and, and you know, dealing with the talent implications from there is, is kind of the best strategy in my in my view. 
Yeah, and I, I really like what you said about just providing those guideposts as an employer for the discussion. Um, because otherwise, I, I feel like there may be just a lot of discussion from employees on things that the employer just doesn't um, want to consider. So, yeah, yeah, good advice there. One thing you were, one thing you were I, really, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Bad, one thing. I mean, I, I, the other thing that I will say is, is that we are seeing in a lot of organizations where people have said, we don't want to come back. We don't. We want to stay fully remote and those kinds of things. And then when they actually do come back and have, you know, even those limited interactions with their colleagues, et cetera, they tend to shift their view and want more interaction. Not fully coming back to the workforce um, or to the workplace, et cetera, but they they start to recognize that they missed some of the interaction. They missed some of the collaboration with their colleagues. And so they they move a little bit more towards the middle rather than we want to stay fully remote. So we have seen that dynamic in a number of places as well. Yeah, really interesting. Is your team suggesting um, to clients about trying some more like maybe focus groups or just strategies as far as a test to, for the employees? Yeah, what we're tr what we're really suggesting to people is model the way you want collaboration to look in the future. So if you're planning on using more advanced technology, you know, more interactive technology and, and things like that, then use those platforms to gather feedback. Um, try to really model what you want the workforce to look like in the future. Um, so I, I think all of those pieces are, you know, our best practices in terms of, of how to actually gather the feedback. That's great. You, you know, you hit a chord with the concern over resignation of, of impact employees and, um, and a lot of questions around adjusting strategy for employee retention, providing assistance to employees. What are you seeing um, some of our some of our clients and some employers doing as far as um, focusing on retention and, and key talent? I think two things. One is they're they are very systematically approaching um, that support to employees uh, question. So thinking about you know how are we going to set people up to be more effective remotely? How are we going to you know really give them the tools that they need, the training that they need, give managers the training they need? Um, what I will say is is that there's a lot of data out there that says the ability of managers to effectively manage remotely is pretty abysmal. Um, and, you know, I, I know we've been talking about that for a long time in terms of really enabling managers with those tools, but it's it's not happening, I can tell you. I mean, from, from the data that I'm seeing, it's really, really bad in terms of, mm. you know, as people go on longer under this remote management piece, they're complaining more and more about the ineffectiveness of their manager at managing that way um, and in that environment. So that's a really important piece of the puzzle as well, because that will continue to tick up this this great resignation wave if, if we're not careful. Um, but the other thing that I would say is focusing more one-on-one -on -one conversations on those key key contributors and key talent players, making sure that you know you're having that personal dialogue with those folks to really understand where they are, what they're concerned about, what will keep them here, um, what will keep them happy and productive in those pieces. Um, so, you know, systematically having the right things in place, but also having those one-on-one -on -one conversations and one-on-one -on -one dialogues with key talent. Yeah, good advice. All right, so a few a few questions around labor automation or business process automation. And, um, you know, I think maybe this was a, a, sm a bit of a smaller employer that said, hey, this, you know, I feel like this used to be more focused for, for large employers. And now, you know, I need to be thinking about it. So I think the, you know, the labor automation pieces kind of coming down into smaller employers, um, yep. especially mm -hmm. that didn't think about it before. So mm -hmm. where where do people start? That have never really considered labor automation. Where, where should they start? Yeah, so I, I think there's two options, and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive in terms of where you start. So one is look at the places where you're having the most trouble finding talent, um, and look at you know what parts of that job can be automated, what parts of that job can be uh, recreated through technology, um, whether it's self-service or, or back office or whatever it might be. It's it's very, it's the hardest way to approach this is trying to take whole jobs and say, we're going to automate the whole job. 
it's much more effective to actually go in and look at the different pieces of jobs and say which of these can be automated and then how does this job evolve and change how does the profile of person that we're looking for evolve and change and in many cases the the, the jobs become um, more interesting and more attractive right um, because you've taken out maybe some of the things that people would rather not do because they can be automated so so that's one place to start is really looking at the, the places where you're having the most trouble um, attracting talent and looking at, at those pieces. The second, quite frankly, is engaging your employees um, and engaging your employees in those discussions about where are the best candidates for automation, what are the things that they find um, most tedious or most repetitive or the things that really are most routine that can be looked at from an automation perspective. So I think both of those are, are good starting points. The other thing that I'll mention though is, is that if you really want to leapfrog this conversation, trying to look at the potential application of artificial intelligence to your processes, or at the very least machine learning, if not full, you know, automate, uh, artificial intelligence to your industry and your processes, et cetera, um, th there's really never been a better time to, to think about taking that leap. Industry by industry, it varies in terms of the sophistication of those solutions. All right, and, and one last question here, and I think this is going to be a bit more opinion because I know your team's gathering data on this, is um, asking about employees relocating. And, and um, the question is, I've seen a lot of employees relocating and employers not adjusting for cost of living. Do you think this is going to continue or will it turn around and employers will start to make more of those cost of living adjustments again for where employees are relocating? <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's opinion right now, but I, I can tell you what I hear from a lot of executives, and that is is that it will become <laughs> more the norm. Um, you know, I, I think that the there's two sides to the coin, right? If people are moving to less expensive places, which frankly tends to be the the trend, um, you know, a lot of employers are like, why should we pay the the premium? Um, and you know. It, the other side of the coin where in some cases employers want to have it both ways is like if they're moving to a more expensive place it's like well that's their choice we didn't we didn't tell them to move there and so we don't <laughs> want to adjust so there's a little bit of schizophrenia on that particular topic right yeah. now but, um, but I do think that that more and more organizations are looking at that and, and trying to understand okay how can we do that um, I think what they're finding is is that you know for people who are in metropolitan areas you know other than the majors you know some of the differences are becoming less in terms of the the cost of living among them unless you're in some of the most expensive cities but i think what they're finding too is is that people who are moving to maybe less um, expensive geographies also have more costs associated with need for bandwidth which maybe not be be as good etc and so they're they're having more direct costs um, that they're having to shoulder in order to make people productive and so a lot is still playing out in terms of that but if I had to guess I would say yeah there are going to be more policies in terms of adjusting cost of living to where people actually are are going to yeah, I, all right. Well, I agree. I think a lot more to come on that topic as employers are just really struggling right now with, with how to handle. So, Brian, it's been a fast and furious hour. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the questions from our participants. Um, we had quite a few we couldn't get to today, but we always try and follow up with our participants. So hopefully we can do that and answer your questions. Thanks again for your time and effort and the consulting team's effort in providing this con content. And, and thanks for everyone for attending on behalf of HRQ and Landroom HR. Thanks for joining us today.